Hey, welcome back. This is Charlie and welcome to Glacial Systems. In this chapter, we will cover how do glaciers form, move, and erode Earth's surface? How does glacial erosion and deposition change landscapes? How does climate influence glacial processes? So the too long, didn't read the chapter version of this chapter is... Uh, glaciers can be divided up into two broad categories. On one hand, there's alpine glaciers. Those are rivers of ice that flow down valleys. And then there's continental glaciers, which are sheets of ice that flow over flatter landscapes. Another big dichotomy or division would be thinking of landforms as erosional or depositional. So an erosional landform is made by removing material, that material is removed, it's transported, and then it's deposited someplace else where it makes a new landscape feature. So through this video, uh, through these slides, I'll try to make it clear whether we're looking at an erosional or a depositional feature. And finally, Earth is warming. This should be a review. Earth has, this is the warmest Earth has ever been while there have been humans alive on it. We have, as humans, have never seen an Earth that is as warm as it is today. So, a glacier is a slow-moving river of ice. It flows just like a river, except maybe three feet a day, so very, very, very slow-moving. They form in areas of permanent snow. You need to have snow that, that lasts year after year. If all the snow melts back in the summertime, you can't have a glacier. In order to form a glacier, you need to have permanent snow year after year. The snow eventually uh, at the bottom is compressed. The air bubbles get squeezed out. It becomes glacial ice. And after that ice becomes about 300 feet thick, it will flow under its own weight downhill under the influence of gravity. So the snow that becomes ice, you could think of as metamorphic rock. It starts off as one material, fluffy snow. Over time, it becomes more granular. It becomes an intermediate product called fern, F-I-R-N. Fern is a more compact, more granular intermediate stage in between ice and snow. So instead of big flaky crystals, like if you took a box of cornflakes, uh, cornflakes representing snowflakes, they're fluffy, they're flat, and you shook that box for a long time, eventually you just have granules of what used to be cornflakes. So you'd have a box of what would be fern, more granular. It's not flaky, it's not fluffy. It's more dense, like sugar crystals rather than cornflakes. And then as the snow continues to fall on top of that, it, as I said, gets squeezed out and you eventually get glacial ice. Once the ice is about 300 feet thick, about 100 meters thick, it will flow downhill under the influence of gravity. Glaciers cover about 11% of Earth's land area. Antarctica and Greenland are where most of Earth's ice is stored right now. During, uh, during past glacial maximums, as much as 30% of Earth was covered with ice, so sea, sea levels globally were about 360 feet lower, about 120 meters lower, because of so much ice, so much water being taken out of the oceans and frozen as ice on the land. So on one hand, we have alpine glaciers. Those flow down a valley. They form from a snowfield. Typically... Alpine glaciers form in a cirque, a bowl-shaped erosional landform formed by glacial erosion at the head of the valley. As the alpine glacier flows downslope, it's a valley glacier flowing within a valley. And at the end, you could have a Piedmont glacier where the valley spreads out onto a large plain like in Alaska. We'll take a look at the Malaspina Glacier in a minute. That's a Piedmont glacier where the narrow valley spreads out into a wide, flat plain. The glacier spreads out. And another option is you could have a tidewater glacier, where the glacier flows off into the ocean. The end of the glacier breaks off to make icebergs in a process called calving. So here's a diagram from the book showing a bunch of cirques. 
Here is another view of a different cirque. So you can see this is rock. Uh, it's been eroded away. This is a bowl-shaped depression. This is a cirque. And inside the cirque is a lake, and that lake is called a tarn. A tarn, T-A-R-N, is a lake inside a cirque. Here we have another cirque, bowl-shaped depression. The glacier in this case would have been flowing out of this depression to the left. And there's a tarn. Here we have a series of valley glaciers. So here's one cirque area, another cirque, another cirque, another cirque. Sort of a broader area of snow accumulation. This one much more bowl-shaped. This one definitely bowl-shaped. And when the glacier flows downhill, uh, it's going to form these lateral moraines and medial moraines. We'll look at those in a minute. Here's another view. This is Greenland. And so up here we have an ice sheet. The ice sheet flows through these canyons where it takes on the form of a valley glacier. And then they join up in a broader valley glacier that is a tidewater glacier. You can see the little bergy bits here at the end. Another alpine glacier flowing through a valley. It's also a tidewater glacier. Here is the view from your textbook of the Malaspina Glacier. You can see it's flowing down this valley, so it's constrained, it's thicker. When it opens up onto the plain, it spreads out and gets really, really wide. Here's a view of the Malaspina Glacier in winter. And you can see it's all covered with snow. In the summertime, the snow is going to melt away, leaving just the ice. So now you can see the, the snow field, or rather this is all ice. There isn't snow on it, it's just ice. You can see how far it's extended in the past, and it's beginning to melt back. It's not flowing as far as it used to before it melts away. This is about 20 miles across. Very, very, very large. And then let's take a look on the ground at one of these areas of lateral moraine. And you can see here's the lateral moraines formed by the glacier pushing up, and then melting back, pushing up, melting back. Here's a tidewater glacier with a calving face making these bergy bits. Here is a calving face where the glacier's falling off into the ocean. Another picture of a glacier actively calving with these huge blocks of ice, and this could be a thousand feet high, incredibly large. Continental glaciers, the largest types of continental glaciers are called ice sheets. So that's what we see in Greenland. That's what's in Antarctica, larger continuous mass of ice covers 80% of Greenland, 90% of Antarctica. The ice is so thick, the average about 2,000 meters, about 6,000 feet thick. The ice is so thick that it's actually pushing the surface of the land below sea level. It's actually depressing Earth's crust. So here's a cross-section of Greenland. This black line is sea level. And you can see in the interior of Greenland, the weight of the ice has been sufficient to depress the continental crust below sea level. In fact, if we magically erased all the ice, you could see much of the interior of Greenland is well below sea level. The same is true in Antarctica. Here we can see, again, this black line is sea level. You can see much of West Antarctica, much of East Antarctica below sea level. Again, if we magically removed all of the ice, you could see that much of the rock, much of the surface of Antarctica is well below sea level because of the weight of the ice pushing it down. After the ice melts, well, we'll take a look maybe at Hudson Bay. Hudson Bay was formed the same, same way. The thickness of the ice pressed the crust below sea level. Hudson Bay is now shrinking because the Earth's crust is bouncing back up. It's rebounding. There are other continental glaciers that are smaller than an ice sheet. We have ice caps. Those are circular. They cover less than 50,000 square miles. Smaller than an ice cap is an ice field. Not extensive enough to form a dome like an ice cap. The Vatnajökull Glacier is one of the largest glaciers in Europe. It's famous because there's a volcano underneath it every now and then. Uh, back in the 90s, for example, this volcano erupted. There was a massive eruption, but it didn't melt through the snow and ice. So it just melted ice underneath. A massive lake formed. There was an outburst flood called a Yokel Alp. That's today's vocabulary word. A Yokel Alp is a glacial outburst flood. So there was a huge lake underneath the glacier that then flowed to the ocean. And this red material is vegetation. This is false color infrared. On false color infrared, 
healthy vegetation shows up as red. They could make it look green. I mean, you, it, you're, if you're digitally processing imaging, you can do almost anything you want with it. They could make it look green, make it look natural, but then we wouldn't know that it was taken using infrared film or infrared sensors. So the convention is in, in remote sensing, if you're using infrared wavelengths of energy, healthy vegetation, you just show up and they, they make it look red. This delta looking feature right here is all of this vegetation was stripped away by the glacial outburst flood. It was so big, massive, massive, massive flood. I saw, I've seen helicopter footage of the flood, blocks of ice the size of multi-story apartment buildings tumbling downstream in this massive flood. Again, that flood is called a yokel alp. Nunatak is a fun word. Nunatak refers to the tips of mountains that stick up above an ice sheet. So again, this ice could be a thousand meters thick, 2000 meters thick. These could be incredibly high mountains, but because of the thickness of the ice sheet, you can only see the top part. And that would be a Nunatak. We've looked at balances, equations, the water balance, looking at precip coming in and evaporation, potet going out. You can do the same thing with a glacier, and they're typically divided into two parts. If you're gaining more water through snow than you're losing to evaporation, melting, and sublimation, that's the accumulation zone. So the, so the part of a glacier that has a positive mass, a positive mass balance, that's the zone of accumulation. The snow falls, compacts to ice. The lower part where it might not be getting any snow because the lower part of the, of the glacier is at a lower elevation. So the surface of the glacier would be warmer. It might not get any snow. It's just ice that hasn't melted yet. So that would be the zone of negative mass balance. And that's called the ablation zone. Also, ice directly sublimates from a solid to a gas. So you've got ice melting, you've got water evaporating, you've got ice sublimating. So here's a diagram showing the accumulation zone where you're getting snow down here in the ablation zone. Uh, water is evaporating, ice is sublimating and melting. So here you're losing mass, here you're gaining mass. The glacier then flows downhill. The midpoint is the equilibrium line where the mass balance would be equal. You're not gaining, you're not losing material, but that would be dynamic. If the climate shifted and it got colder or wetter, so there was more snow, the equilibrium line is gonna shift down slope. On the other hand, 95% of alpine glaciers are shrinking back. The climate is warming, so the ablation zone is shifting up. In fact, many glaciers no longer have an equi equilibrium line. Many glaciers no longer have an accumulation zone. It's all just a zone of ablation. They're all melting back. Well, 95% anyway. So here we have the snow covered part. This is just ice. This would be the zone of accumulation. And then this could be the equilibrium line perhaps. The bottom part, it's just ice, just snow. This would be the zone of ablation where it's just melting, negative mass balance. As I mentioned, the equilibrium line divides the zone of accumulation and the zone of ablation. Retreat or advance depends on mass balance. If it's gaining ice, it'll flow downslope farther before it melts away. If the accumulation exceeds ablation, you have glacial growth. If you have more ablation than you have accumulation, there's glacial retreat. So in this diagram, we have the zone of accumulation falling into this cirque. The ice gets to be about 300 feet thick. It flows down slope. Here we have the equilibrium line. Down slope, we have the ablation zone where there's a negative mass balance. And we have moraine. As the glacier flows along, it's going to pick up rocks. It's going to grind those rocks against the ground. It's going to scrape everything down to bedrock. Some of that material is going to get stuck in the middle of the glacier and transported down. Some of it will just be pushed to the end. And that material that the glacier transports is called moraine. So there's the terminal moraine, that's the, that would mark the, the farthest extent of the glacier. And then if, the, if conditions get warmer, so the glacier melts back and it makes an intermediate one, that's a recessional moraine. And then at the end of the glacier is the end moraine. There's also glacier, there's also moraine at the sides, that's called lateral moraine. 
other side, lateral moraine. And then if two glaciers flow together, the lateral moraine, the lateral moraine gets stuck in the middle, and then it's called medial moraine. Here's another diagram. On this one, they're showing the fern line. So above the fern line, you'd have snow and fern on top of the ice. Below the fern line, it's just ice. We have terminal moraine, we have a recessional moraine, and we have an end moraine here at the end. Lateral, lateral, medial. So let's take a look at an animation of how all of this works. Snow accumulating in the upper reaches of the glacier. When it gets to be about 300 feet thick, it'll flow downhill under the weight of gravity. So here's the snow line, the fern line. And as the glacier's flowing along, it's moving inside, it's moving internally. It can pause, and so this would be the terminal moraine. This would be the current end moraine. If the glacier retreats farther, that'll be a recessional moraine. Then we have the end moraine. And a couple other, other aspects of ice as the glacier flows along, the end can remain in place. So if we took a time lapse over years, you could see perhaps the glacier, the end of the glacier isn't, isn't appearing to move, but inside the glacier, it's still moving. So as it's flowing down slope, it's also melting, also sublimating. So the end is gonna look like it's staying in one place, but because the glacier's flowing internally, the material that it's transporting, as well as the material that it's, it's picked up off of the bed and sliding along, it's gonna accumulate at the end, and that's one of the ways that we accumulate these terminal, recessional, and end moraines. Another interesting aspect of ice is once the ice gets thick enough, it's gonna flow down slope, as it flows down slope, if it flows over a hill made of rock and the ice is compressed, it will melt. You can actually break the bonds of ice and you get water. So when you compress, if you compress ice, you can get water. And then when the ice expands again, it'll freeze to the rock. And as the glacier moves along, it'll rip chunks of the rock off, pluck chunks of those rock off in a process called glacial plucking. Just like in the movie, A Toy Story or A Christmas Story, uh, that kid got his tongue stuck to a light post because or a flag post because it was wintertime and his tongue froze to it. Same thing happens with a glacier. And this is how you get glacial plucking. So here we have a diagram showing a glacier that's in retreat. Uh, it used to be this thick. It used to extend this far down slope. So here's the terminal moraine. Then you have a series of recessional moraines. Here's the end moraine, lateral, lateral, medial moraine. So the glacier shrinks back. When glaciers retreat, they lose volume and they lose length. And so here you've got the end moraine, end moraine, recessional, and then a terminal moraine because that's as far as the glacier had extended so some depositional features, as the glacier scrapes out the rock to make the cirque, it's eroding material, forming the erosional feature of the cirque. That material that's been scraped away then gets transported and deposited someplace else. So that material gets deposited at the sides, at the end, that's moraine, deposited glacial sediment composed of unsorted till. It's unsorted, it's all jumbled up, and that's one of the ways we can tell the difference between glacial till, because it's unsorted, large rock, small rock, sand, rock flower, very powdery rock made by erosion, as opposed to sediment that's transported by water. As you remember from the last chapter, the ability of water to transport material depends on the volume and the velocity. So typically with a flood, you have high velocity and then lower velocity. So during the high velocity phase, you get the transport and deposition of large material and then smaller and smaller and smaller material as the floodwaters slow down. So you get a sorting of large material on the bottom, smaller, smaller, smaller on top. But the moraine, because it's transported by a glacier, everything gets moved. Boulders the size of houses, sand, flour, everything in between. So we've got lateral moraine along the sides. We've got medial moraine at the middle, the middle of the glacier. Terminal moraine at the farthest extent. Recessional moraine where the glacier paused. So here we've got a top view of a glacier. We've got lateral, lateral, and medial moraine. Diagram showing lateral, lateral, medial, terminal, End moraine, I would call this a recessional moraine. This would be the end moraine. This would be the terminal moraine. 
And there's a link to Google Earth. If you click the link, it'll open up a web page, take you to Google Earth, and take you to the page that take you to a, a landscape that has good examples of lateral and medial moraines. So here we have medial, I'm sorry, lateral, lateral, and medial. This is lateral, the one is lateral, the two is our medial moraine. We're back to Greenland. Here we've got the fern line. There's snow and fern on top of the ice. Down here, there's just ice. So this is a medial moraine. All these stripes, medial, 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 medial. That would be lateral. That would be lateral. That's a medial. That's a medial. That's a medial. Many, many, many medial moraines. Lateral, lateral, medial. Medial, lateral, 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 medial. Lateral, medial. Medial, 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 lateral. This is an interesting, interesting picture. It's a alpine glacier. It's in retreat. It's melting back. So here's the end moraine. Here is a lateral moraine. Here is a smaller, a smaller lateral moraine. And that tells us that the glacier extended, would have filled up from here to here. And then conditions changed. It got warmer. The glacier retreated back, but it paused for a while at this level. So if you had come by when the glacier was here, the glacier would have filled up from here to here, and now it's retreated back again. So we have lateral moraines that are indicating the evidence of a, a smaller glacier, or larger than now, but smaller than the biggest it was. Here we have a, a, a short alpine glacier flowing into a lake. This is the end moraine, and this is really unusual because what happens, because the end moraine is made up of unsorted material, rocks and boulders and sand and silt, Typically, water moves it, and you get a stream flowing down this that blows out the end of the terminal moraine. We'll take a look at some glaciers in the Sierras that are examples of that. But this lake is formed by the terminal moraine that's acting as a dam for this little lake. Globally, mountain glaciers are in retreat. About 95% of mountain glaciers worldwide are in retreat. This is looking at the mass balance. You can see from 1980 to the present, there wasn't a single year where alpine glaciers had a, had a good year, where they got more ice than they lost. If they had, the bar would stick up on top of the zero line. This is the Muir Glacier in Alaska. This picture was taken in 1941. It's part of a repeat photography project where they find a picture taken of a glacier in the past, go to the exact same place today and take another picture. So in 1941, you can see this is the thickness of the glacier. This is the extent of the glacier. And if you notice, there's no vegetation. So some sort of polar climate because there's no trees. Remember, you can't have trees in a polar climate the summertime, even though it thaws out, it's just too cold. But now we have trees in 2004. So the climate has shifted from a polar climate to some sort of microthermal climate. And here's the trim line. This is how thick that glacier was uh, back in 1941. You can see the erosion, the scouring of the rock by the glacier, indicating that it used to flow down here, used to be that thick, and now it's retreated. Here we have another glacier in Alaska with a medial moraine. And where the glacier is and where it was in 2013. So you can see enormously thick. In fact, this, the glacier would have been covering up all of that extending out into the foreground. And here's some sort of passenger cruise ship for scale. This is a video of sea ice. Sea ice is just like it sounds, ice that forms in the ocean. The video starts in 1985. In 1985, uh, we back it up all the way to the beginning. Hopefully I can do that. We had almost 2.5 million square kilometers of ice over four years old. So to make sea ice, you need to have it be well below freezing. You're actually freezing salt water. When the salt water freezes, it squeezes out the salt and you end up with fresh ice. And if that ice doesn't melt in the summertime, it'll get thicker in the winter. If it doesn't melt in the summertime, it gets thicker in the winter. So the older the ice is, the thicker it is. Polar bears, walruses, seals depend on the thicker multi-year ice. The one to two year old ice, it's too thin and it can't support their weight. So polar bears hunt on the ice. 
Walruses and seals use the ice to feed, to rest, uh, to raise their young. And as the, if I click on the video, we can play it through. You can see over time, not only the area of ice is getting smaller and smaller, but the relative proportion of multi-year ice is also declining. So here we have September 2016. You can see that, that well, back in 1985, there was over, well, there's five, over 5 million square kilometers of ice in September 2016. Lots and lots of old ice, some uh, younger ice, and now September 2016, almost no multi-year ice left. And there's a positive feedback loop to that. And the positive feedback wor loop works like this. As the planet warms, it melts ice. As the ice melts, it exposes dark water, which absorbs heat and gets warm. So in the fall, it takes longer for the ice to freeze. Because it takes longer for the ice to freeze, it's not as thick. So in the springtime, it melts faster. So there's open water for more of the year. So the water gets warmer, so it takes longer to freeze in the winter. Because it took longer to freeze, the ice is thinner, so in the spring it melts away faster. This also kicks off a second positive feedback loop, and that's from shipping. So if you're taking goods from Europe over to North America, especially the West Coast, the easiest way to do that is via the, what's called the Northwest Passage. This route over the top of the world going over the North Pole is way shorter. However, it's been impossible until recently because of the extensive ice. Uh, it is anticipated that we will see ice entirely ice-free summers in our lifetime up here in the north. Uh, another aspect of increased shipping is the ships, the cargo ships burn oil. And the exhaust from that is very black like diesel exhaust from 18 wheelers. That diesel exhaust or the oil exhaust, the black carbon settles out on the ice, making it black so it melts faster. So there's less ice, so there's more ships. So there's more carbon, so there's less ice, so there's more ships. So at least two really destructive feedback loops going on in the Arctic with regards to losing sea ice. Here we have a view of sea ice. At the North Pole, there's nothing but ice. There's no land mass like there is in Antarctica. In Antarctica, there's a huge continent, but at the North Pole, it's just ice over water. Glacial movement is pretty slow. The fastest glacier, the Jakobshavn Eisbrei, moves about 100 feet a day. Some, of, some glaciers aren't flowing at all, like an ice field. It might be so small that it doesn't, it's not thick enough for it to flow downhill. It might move a foot and a half a year. Typically, glaciers flow about three feet a day, about a meter a day. The top is brittle because there's not a lot of weight on it. The center and bottom, there's enough weight that it flows like a plastic. And so it'll actually deform under the weight of the ice that's above it. Within a valley glacier, the greatest movement happens internally off the bottom. Against, where the bottom flows against the ground, there's a lot of friction, so it doesn't flow very quickly. In the middle of the glacier, though, the ice deforms and flows fastest. You can compress ice, as I mentioned before, if you can compress it slowly, it will flow. If you compress it quickly, you can break it and get water, uh, but it doesn't stretch. Instead of stretching, it just breaks and makes these cracks called crevices. So at the bottom of the glacier, it's sliding along. That's called basal slip. The upper portion moves faster than the lower portion because of friction, exactly like a river. Uh, it's exactly, exactly, exactly like a river. Uh, where the river's flowing against the bed, it's going to be slower than the center part of a river. Crevices happen uh, when the ice tries to stretch. Some glaciers have surges where they'll flow very quickly for a couple days and then they'll not move and then they might jump forward and then not move. So here we have a side view of a glacier flowing over the ground. On the upstream side of these humps, there's melting. So you've got water, the water expands, freezes, and then there's plucking. We've got crevices forming. So if the ice tries to stretch, that's how you get crevices. Like if the ice was, was flowing over what is going to become a Rouche Moutonnet, which we'll talk about later, you can see that this radius is smaller than this radius. 
But at this point, this length is the same as this length, but now this length is much shorter. The ice can't stretch, so instead you just get these huge cracks called crevices caused by tension. Another view, you can see the tension zone. You'd expect to see crevices, crevices. Glaciers erode in transport sediment. There's glacial abrasion. In fact, one of those big, big, big things, so this will be the third big thing, uh, is that glaciers, as they move along, they will scour and scratch and remove material. You get abrasion, you get plucking. So that material is being eroded and weathered. And then the biggest, the biggest, biggest thing with glaciers is stream cut valleys are V-shaped glacial valleys. Once a glacier flows down a V-shaped valley, it will remove material and become a U-shaped valley. Pre-glacial, V-shaped. As a glacier flows down it, it'll erode that material and you'll get a U-shaped valley. That is the biggest, most important. And then some of the erosional features, this narrow ridge line is called an arete or a sawtooth. Here we have a cirque, the bowl where it's beginning, where the glacier forms and flows down the valley. We've got a sawtooth ridge, we've got an arete. If you have two glaciers flowing down parallel valleys, the ridge line in between them can get really, really steep and narrow, and that's called an arete. If you have a bunch of glaciers in a radial arrangement around a central peak, you can form a horn like the Matterhorn. And then after the glacier is gone, after they melt away, you can have a U-shaped valley. That's the biggest, most obvious. If you have tributary glaciers that didn't erode down to the base level of the main valley, you have hanging valleys with hanging waterfalls. Yosemite has excellent examples of hanging waterfalls. Uh, if there's a string of lakes in this valley, a lake, so it'd be lake with a stream, lake, stream, lake, stream, lake, stream. Those are called Paternoster lakes. We'll take a look at those later too. Paternoster lakes a horn, a tarn, a low spot on a ridge line is called a coal You could uh, or a pass. I think this is a much better coal. I would have put that right there. That's a better coal. Here's another coal. It's just a low spot in a ridge line. We've got cirques, we've got a rets, the coal, the pass, the horn, the erosional feature. U-shaped valley is the biggest, most obvious indication that a valley that a valley has been shaped by a glacier. Talus slopes are talus slopes are slopes made of loose rock. That freeze thaw weathering that happens a lot in alpine areas makes loose rock. It tumbles downhill, comes to rest at the angle of repose, forming talus slopes. Glaciers also will pick up and transport rocks, boulders, boulders the size of houses. And then when the glacier melts back, that rock is just dropped wherever it was. Uh, and those are called glacial erratics. We'll look at some pictures. To be a really cool glacial erratic, it helps if you're a different rock than the rock you're dropped on top of. Tarn, that's a lake in a cirque. Paternoster lakes are a chain of small circular lakes that are going down a glacial valley. Uh, they're called Paternoster Lakes. I think Louis Agassiz was a Swiss geomorphologist. Uh, he gave a lot of these names, created a lot of these names. Paternoster comes from our father. Uh, evidently, somebody thought they looked like rosary beads because you've got a little round lake and then a stream and a little round lake and a stream, little round lake and a stream, just like rosary beads. Hanging valleys. A fjord, if you have a valley that's then flooded with seawater because sea level rose. That's how you get a fjord. Typically have very steep sides. You might have seen these. Uh, I'll try to include some videos of people in wingsuits, typically in Norway, flying off of the tops of these fjords. Glacier retreats, leaves behind a deep valley. Sea level rises and floods it. So let's take a look at some glacial landforms. So here we have an arete, a very, very steep, narrow ridge, a horn, a cirque, a coal. This would be uh, one, one, two, three, four, five Paternoster lakes down this U-shaped valley. This ridge line would be an arete. That would be a coal. That's a really good coal. These are the minarets. These are down by Devil's Post Pile, down by Mammoth Lakes. Very, very steep ridge line. The Matterhorn is a good example of a horn. 
Another view of the Matterhorn. Hanging Valley in Yosemite. Hanging Valley with a hanging waterfall. Another view, this is Bridal Veil Falls in uh, Yosemite Valley. Here's Half Dome. Half Dome was not removed by a glacier. That's not why it looks like that. It looks like that due to joints, those cracks in the rock. These are uh, granite lakes up in Yosemite in Tuolumne Meadows. This is a cirque and this is a tarn. Lake in a cirque is a tarn. This is a cirque, that erosional landscape. So this would have been filled up with snow that would have been compacted to ice and then slowly flowed down slope. This is just an example of frost wedging. Water gets into the cracks in the rock, breaks it apart, giving it this blocky appearance. This is a glacial erratic. Uh, perched on top of, and you can't really see it, but this brownish rock down here is incredibly smooth, and that's glacial polish. As the glacier flows over the landscape, it picks up rocks and it grinds those rocks against bedrock, and eventually the rock gets so finely ground up that it becomes powdery, and that acts like a polishing paste. That as the ice flows over the land, over the rock, it'll actually get polished just like marble. And that's called glacial polish. And so we know that this has to be an erratic because the only way you can have glacial polish is to have the ice flowing over the surface of the rock, which couldn't have happened with this rock here. This is on top of Lembert Dome. Another view on top of Lembert Dome, some of the other glacial erratics. A close-up of glacial polish showing the showing the the striations, that's the technical term for these scratch marks that tell us which direction the glacier was flowing in. And it also tells us that this is a glacial erratic because in order to get these striations and polish, the glacier has to be flowing against the rock. Glacial polish, more glacial polish. This is also Tuolumne Meadows at the foot of Lembert Dome. These are xenoliths. So Yosemite is made up of granite. As that granite melted its way up through the rock, it melted up through existing layers of rock that were there already. And some of those rocks got broken off and partially melted, which was contact metamorphism. So these rocks have been metamorphosed, and so they're harder and more resistant to weathering. So this is what 20 or 10,000, 10, 20,000 years of weathering looks like that the granite is weathering away faster than these metamorphic rocks. So if we came back in another 20,000 years, I would expect the difference between the xenoliths and the granite to be twice as big because this rock is eroding more slowly. Other features that are important in this example, this is from Olmsted Point in Yosemite. There's a, a joint, a crack in the rock, and you can see there's little tufts of grass growing. So as they grow, the roots are going to wedge the rock apart. Probably not a whole lot, but... Water is going to accumulate there. The water is going to create chemical weathering and also physical weathering. Physical weathering when it's cold enough to freeze and force the rock apart. Chemical weathering in the summer, just the moisture itself is going to gradually dissolve away some of the minerals in the rock. So here we've got more xenoliths. That's just an exceptionally good one. This is pressure release jointing from the chapter on weathering mechanisms. Pressure release joining these big slabs. Here's more pressure release joining that the granite flakes in these huge slabs. Another view from Olmsted Point. And this is just like a greatest hits list of alpine glacial features. We've got exfoliation and sheeting from pressure release joining. We've got a joint in the rock. We've got a glacial erratic. We've got glacial polish and we have some xenoliths. This is at Mount Lassen, an example of glacial striations. There was a glacier that flowed from here, from the, from the bottom of the picture, up over this cliff, and it's scratched and polished the surface of the rock. Close up of the glacial striations, these parallel scratches in the rock. And one of the erosional features is a Roche Moutonne. So this is Lembert Dome, it is in Yosemite. The glacier was flowing in this case from right to left. On the upstream side, there's abrasion and plucking. The water, or rather the ice gets compressed, it breaks, it becomes water. It then freezes on the downslope side and rips off chunks of the rock. So you have a blunt downstream and a tapered upstream. The Roche Moutonne is made of solid rock 
There's abrasion and polishing on the upstream side and then plucking on the downslope side. Another view of a Roche Moutonne. This is where you'd get crevices. As the ice is trying to expand going over the top of the rock, there's abrasion on the uphill side, plucking on the downslope side. Water also gets into cracks, it'll freeze, it'll physically weather it, so you get this distinctive distinctive shape of a Roche Moutonne with a tapered upslope. So in this case, it's flowing from left to right. You'd get melting, melting on the upstream side, freezing and plucking on the downslope side. There's another view of Lembert Dome, the upstream side, the downstream side. A little rock outcropping as a Roche Moutonne tapered upstream, blunt downstream. Another view, this is Lembert Dome. You can see the tapered upstream side and the blunt downstream side. Another view from Lembert Dome, some exfoliation and sheeting, some pretty swirls in the rock. Oh, this is Pothole Dome. That's another, another Roche Moutonne up in Tuolumne Meadows in Yosemite. A view from the top of Lembert Dome. We've got exfoliation and sheeting. We've got chemical weathering going on because you can see these crystals are weathering out. Here we have a glacial erratic. I believe this is Greenland. So you've got little tiny glaciers flowing in to this larger glacier. Over here you can see it's a tidewater glacier because it's emptying out onto the ocean. You can see down here it's just ice. And up here there's snow on top of the ice. So right in here would be the fern line. Same thing over here, you can see the fern line, there's snow on top of the ice and down here it's just ice. And a fjord. So this is a valley that would have been filled by a glacier 20,000 years ago. 20,000 years ago, sea level was 360 feet lower. And then as the glacier melted away, as glaciers globally melted away, the glacier would have left this valley and then sea levels came up and flooded the bottom of it. So you end up with these steep sides and a flooded bottom. So you get the glacier extending down. Here you have the pre-glacial landscape. 70 million years ago, this is what it would have looked like with just a plain. Glacier extends down, forms this valley, but then uh, everything melted, sea level rose, and so that valley gets filled with water. This is Norway, a bunch of different features, a glacial tarn, a U-shaped valley, that's a fjord. Another glacial U-shaped valley, that's a fjord. Ah, continental features. Let's talk about continental features. Here we have a glacier in retreat. It would have extended out to here. And in fact, that's really convenient because we've got the orange ground and the green ground. So the green part is the outwash plain and the orange part is the till plain. Till, moraine, they're kind of synonymous. So the material that's transported by the glacier is till. Here we have glacial till, it would be unsorted. Large rocks, small rocks, powder, flour, all of it mixed in together. But then wind and water are gonna wash that out to the outwash plane. So the outwash plane, it would be sorted out by size depending on stream flow or wind speed. You could also have a delta where the where these streams are flowing underneath the glacier. They could form deltas. Streams under the glacier will also form eskers, and I'll talk about eskers. Underneath the glacier, you'll get these mounded piles of loose sediment called drumlins. We'll look at drumlins in a bit. So we've got an esker, an esker is a stream bed that's on top of the ground. So this, this stream flowing under the glacier is actually gonna melt up into the glacier. It's going to transport material, and then when the glacier melts away, the stream bed is going to be revealed as being on top of the ground, which is really different. We also have a kettle lake. I'll talk about those. And little piles of sediment called cames. So typical depositional landforms produced by continental glaciation. The biggest erosional feature formed by continental glaciations would be the completely flat northeast and midwest of the United States, that this sheet of ice, because it's so huge, just planes off everything down to bedrock. And then when the glacier retreats, you're left with random piles of, of loose debris, forming deranged drainage, swampy areas, high to low ground. There isn't really that pattern, so you get lots of swampy areas, lots of, lots of poorly drained areas, and wandering streams called deranged drainage. 
So we have drumlins, we have eskers, we have cames, we have kettle lakes. You can have a delta. Outwash plain is the part that's made of material that got washed out from the till plain. So another view, you've got the glacier back in the day, streams flowing under the glacier. That's going to make an esker when it retreats. You've got, this would be glacial till, and then down here, this would be outwash plain. And across the Midwest, those glaciers extended here down into Illinois and Indiana and Ohio, Pennsylvania. So moraines, recessional moraines all the way down across the Midwest, huge lobes because they would have advanced and then retreated. The Great Lakes were also carved out by these sheets of ice. Those glacial deposits till the unsorted sediment. It's unstratified. It's all mixed in together. The outwash is made up of the stuff that washed out. So it's sorted, stratified. Yeah, this is till. It's moraine. You can see there's large rocks. They're blocky. They're angular. They're mixed up with powder, rock flour, sand, silt, all that stuff jumbled together. Beautiful picture of glacial moraine. This would be stratified sediment. So you can see right here, those rocks are slightly larger. Then it gets smaller. This, these rocks or this sediment's all much finer grained. The larger the grain, the faster that water had to be traveling to transport it. And so you, you get this layer after layer after layer. This would be formed of, of floods with higher speed and then lower speed and higher speed and lower speed water making the outwash plain. So again, it's really obvious whether you're looking at moraine or you're looking at outwash. So down here, you can see the outwash. If this glacier melted back immediately, this would be a till. This is outwash. Glacier, tributary glacier coming down. This would be then medial moraine. Some depositional features. Here we've got the words eskers. That's a stream bed that's gonna be actually on top of the ground. They form along the channel of a meltwater stream. Drumlins, they look like whales swimming upstream. Those are deposited till streamlined in the direction of movement. A kettle, a kettle lake. Yeah, kettle lake forms when an isolated block of ice is left behind. Sediment will accumulate around it. It'll melt away, leaving a hole that then fills with rainwater. Uh, Walden Pond. Walden Pond is actually a kettle lake. I think that's pretty interesting. A came is a small hill of sediment that accumulates on top of the glacier. And then when the glacier melts away, that material just gets dropped on the ground. So again, we've got an esker. We've got cames. We've got till. We've got kettle lakes. A recessional moraine. This would be the till plain, the outwash plain. Outwash plain. A recessional moraine right here or an end moraine. I guess that would be end moraine. I don't really see any recessional moraines. That looks like a formal lateral moraine. And then if the glacier was removed instantly, underneath it would be till plain, probably some eskers as well, because you can see there's water flowing underneath the glacier. This was the extent of Pleistocene glaciation at the glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago. So 20,000 years ago, much of Canada, in fact, almost all of Canada, much of the Northeast and Northern Midwest American states were covered by a huge sheet of ice. That sheet of ice was so massive, so thick, it pressed the surface of the ground below sea level. Ah, uh, let's talk about Long Island. So Long Island is down in here. Long Island is a terminal moraine. In fact, the Long Island Parkway, the freeway, is on top of the crest of the moraine. My wife went to Long Island on business a couple of years ago, so I looked it up on Wikipedia, because I love Wikipedia, despite what your teachers have told you. They're just jelly. Wikipedia is fantastic. Yes, anybody can edit it, but they've really clamped down on the knuckleheads messing up stuff. So, I urge you always take a look at Wikipedia first, especially for geography concepts like this, Long Island. So uh, the north-facing beaches are very different than the south-facing beaches. The north-facing beaches are all on the till plain. So there's rocks and sediment, and it's all jumbled together. 
the smaller sediment is going to get washed out. And so the south facing beaches, this was the extent, this is the terminal moraine. So this is all outwash plain. So the southern beaches, the south facing beaches on Long Island have sand. The north facing beaches have rocks. And that's because this was till plain and this is outwash plain. That would be a great extra credit question for the final exam. So here we have a glacier flowing along. We have a tunnel under the glacier with a stream flowing through it. We have these depressions on top of the glacier. As the glacier starts to melt back, it's going to expose uh, the outwash plain. The outwash plain is going to get exposed. The till plain is going to get, 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 going to get exposed. And then what's going to happen is wind is going to pick up that dust, pick up that sand, blow it around, and deposit it on top of the glacier. So we've got the stream bed underneath. We have these depressions on top of the glacier. And then when the glacier melts away, that stream bed is going to be revealed as an esker. And then those depressions that filled with sand, that sand and silt is going to get deposited in these little hills called kames, K-A-M-E. Here we have a came. There's a depression of the ice. It fills with sediment. The glacier retreats back. The sediments get, just gets dropped in the ground, making a came. Or conversely, you could have a block of ice that's left behind by a retreating glacier. Uh, it's going to make a hole in the ground. Sediment is going to get blown by wind and build up around it. So then you're left with a hole in the ground that's going to fill up with rainwater, making a kettle lake. So we've got kames, we've got kettle lakes, we've got eskers. This would form a came. This would form a kettle lake. This would form a kettle lake. In fact, there's the kettle lake. There's the kettle lake. That's going to form a came. Here we've got a kettle lake forming. There was a block of ice there. Exposed stagnant ice indicated by the green arrow. So there's, there's dirt and sand and silt on top of the ice. When the ice melts away, it'll form a depression. We might get another kettle lake. You can also get drumlins. I love drumlins. Drumlins are the evil twin of a Roche Moutonnet. They are, they are not alike at all. In fact, in every possible way, they are different. A Roche Moutonnet is alpine. Drumlins are continental. A Roche Moutonnet is made of solid rock. It's an erosional landscape. A drumlin is made up of loose sediment, and it's a depositional landscape feature. The Roche Moutonnet is tapered upstream and blunt downstream. The drumlin is blunt upstream and tapered downstream. So in this, in this diagram, the glacier would have been flowing from left to right. This streamlined pile of sediment exists underneath the ice sheet and it's revealed when the ice sheet melts away. And typically they occur in swarms. So it wouldn't just be one drumlin, it would be a whole bunch of drumlins. Here's another view of the same thing. Glacier flowing from left to right. It's going to be blunt upstream and tapered downstream. That's another good final exam test question. What are all of the differences between a Roche Moutonnet and a Drumlin? Here's a view of a Drumlin. So we know it was flowing from left to right because that's the blunt side. Side view of a Drumlin. Again, flowing from left to right. From left to right. And here we have a swarm of drumlins. These aren't quite as dramatic. Uh, it, actually, it's kind of tough to tell which direction it was flowing, but I would guess that it was flowing from the top of the picture straight down towards the bottom of the picture. Drumlin landscape in Patagonia. Thank you, H. Steinberg. Lovely photograph. Oh, right. So this is continental glaciation. It's just flat, 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 flat. Here we have another view of how eskers are formed. You have this tunnel under the ice. Sediment is going to be, alluvium is going to be transported and deposited under the ice. And then when the ice melts away, the perched stream bed is revealed. Thank you, Rob Gamesby from coolgeography.uk. Here we have a bunch of eskers. Here we have one esker on a snowy landscape. So this would have been continentally glaciated. And you can see there's a stream that would have been flowing under the glacier. This is an esker, again, continental glaciation. Another esker formed by continental glaciation. 
lovely, lovely eskers and a stream. Paraglacial environments are around glacial environments. Uh, typically, the the surface is below freezing for two years. If the surface is below freezing for two years, so paraglacial environments are the environments on the periphery of glacial areas. So they're very cold. Typically, they have permafrost. If the soil is frozen for more than two years, permafrost develops. Permafrost exists in places where it's frozen year after year after year. So you get it at high latitude areas or high elevation areas. So you could have Arctic permafrost. You could also have high elevation permafrost. Here's the distribution of permafrost. Uh, you can see it's centered on the North Pole. So this would be alpine permafrost. It's high in elevation. This would be Arctic permafrost. It is high in latitude. Permafrost, as you should remember, is of concern because it's thawing. And as it thaws, the organic material breaks down by bacteria and the bacteria release methane. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So here we have areas that we think will be thawed by 2050, by 2100, and by 2100, only the yellow areas we think will still have permafrost. The rest of it will have thawed out. There's the active layer on top. In the spring, the active layer is going to thaw. In the wintertime, it's going to freeze. You could get daily or seasonal freeze-thaw cycles up at the top layer of permafrost. Down below, though, it's going to remain frozen year-round. So the farther north you go, the thicker the permafrost, the thicker the continuous permafrost is. So 1,200 feet thick. You could dig down for 1,200 feet thick, and it would be frozen, frozen, frozen. And the reason it gets thicker as you go farther towards the poles is because of Earth's geothermal heat gradient. If you were to dig down through Earth, as you dig down, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. In South Africa, there's some diamond mines that are a mile below ground, and it's 120 degrees all the time. So it takes colder conditions on top to make it freeze thicker down through the, through the uh, soil. So up here towards... Uh, where's the diagram? So here we've got the top 1,200 feet frozen. Here we've got 45 meters frozen. And there's a nice opposite thing going on. The thicker the continuous permafrost, the thinner the active layer. The thinner the permafrost, the thicker the active layer. The active layer is the part that's going to thaw out in the spring. Here it's 10 feet thick. Here it's like a foot and a half thick. So these soils then are going to be really waterlogged. All that snow on top is going to melt. There's not a whole lot of soil for it to soak up the water. So the, the soils tend to be really, really soggy, really, really marshy. Uh, ideal breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Another fun thing that's formed as water freezes, as you all know, it expands 9%. And so as the ice freezes, it'll create patterns called pattern ground. Here's a cool YouTube video to watch on it. Go watch that. Another YouTube on pattern ground. Here is an example of pattern ground. So the, the water gets into cracks in the soil and then it freezes and it'll wedge these cracks apart. So you get these polygons. Down here, there's probably a frozen layer of water that's lifted the surface of the ground up and that's called a pingo, P-I-N-G-O, pingo. A very large pingo formed by frozen ice, or frozen water, ice, ice. Here we have patterned ground, the gradual expansion and contraction and expansion and contraction of moisture in the ground creates these circles. They're not created by animals or plants, it's just the natural freeze-thaw cycles, which is really interesting because scientists have seen patterned ground on Mars. Here's a cross-section showing how you get ice wedges, making these polygons, and then a pingo. Uh, mass movement. Soliflexion, which is like soil creep. The soil gets kind of soupy and gradually oozes down slope in these big lobes. So it's happening very slowly on the time scale of years, just gradually working its way down under the influence of gravity. You could melt permafrost. So... 
Yeah, you should never build a house directly on permafrost because you'll melt the permafrost and then your house will collapse into a pit of mud. So if you're building in permafrost, typically they have to uh, put them up on pilings, on stilts to keep them off of the ground, to keep it from thawing the ground. Pleistocene. I'm going to talk about the Pleistocene really briefly. The Pleistocene was the last ice age. The Pleistocene began 2.5 million years ago. Uh, in that time, we've seen at least 22, 23 glacial interglacial cycles of 10,000 years of warm, 90,000 years of cold. Pleistocene began two and a half million years ago, ended about 11,700 years ago. YA is years ago. Depending on where you are in the world, the Pleistocene ended around 20,000 to about 10,000 years ago. So here we've got the Pleistocene. And things were different. Ice Age temperatures and landscapes were very different. So during that glacial period, things would have been colder for 90,000 years and then 10,000 years of warm. Interglacial, 10,000. Glacial, 90,000. Deep sea cores, ice cores, all of that tells us how we know. Here's a shot. This is a map, a reconstruction of Earth as it was during the glass glacial maximum with the massive ice sheets over North America, over Eurasia. Sea level was about 360 feet lower, so you could walk from Australia to New Guinea. You could walk from Indonesia to Malaysia to Thailand to China. You could walk from England to France. Heck, you could walk from Asia to North America. This is the Bering Land Bridge. All this green area was dry land. So about 18,000 years ago, this is the way it looked. There would have been ice-free corridors, we think, for humans to migrate out of Asia into North America, roughly 18,000 years ago. Well, this map is showing the way Earth looked about 18,000 years ago. There's another view showing what the dry land was about 18,000 years ago. Yeah, I always thought the Bering Land Bridge was just like a very narrow bridge between the little nose of Alaska and uh, Russia. But no, it was, it was a significantly wide coastal plain. So during the Pleistocene, which began 2.5 million years ago, there were wetter and warmer periods called pluvial periods. And during those pluvial periods, we had lakes, large lakes. The pluvial period during the Pleistocene from like 12,000 to 30,000 years ago, the American West was filled with lakes. Lake Bonneville, Lake Lahontan were the largest lakes in North America. Lake Bonneville has evaporated away and now it's an eighth of its former size and we call it the Great Salt Lake. In fact, uh, Bonneville salt flats are, are the result of the evaporation of Lake Bonneville. So 18,000 years ago, massive ice sheet, 10,000 feet of ice over what is now Hudson Bay, which is why Hudson Bay is where it is. By 9,500 years ago, the ice had melted back from the U.S., was just found up in Canada. So here we have the... Purple areas were lakes. Uh, Death Valley was filled in with Lake Manly. Lake Lahontan uh, was throughout this area. All of this would have been Lake Bonneville, which is now melted back to be the Bonneville Salt Flats and the Great Salt Lake. Here we have another view of California, uh, the American West at this time. There are also massive outburst floods, these lobes, the little fingers of ice coming down that would alter the flow of rivers. There were a couple times when massive lakes built up with that were held back by ice dams. When those ice dams broke, massive floods scoured across, uh, across Idaho and Washington and Oregon and made these features called the channeled scablands. So you've probably seen after it rains in the gutter, little, little ripple marks made by the moving water. Well, in the channeled scablands, there are ripples, but instead of them being just a couple millimeters high, they're like a hundred feet high. Uh, it took a high school or a middle school science teacher to look at it and realize, oh my gosh, these hills, these parallel hills are actually ripple marks from a massive, massive flood. And then he had to figure out how the hell did this happen? J. Harlan Bretz was the guy's name. I've put some, some uh, videos in the playlist for glaciers. I hope you check him out 
they're just absolutely staggering. The, the volume of water, the massive, massive, massive reshaping of the Earth's surface by these massive floods, uh, these glacial outburst floods, again and again and again during the Pleistocene. And there would have been humans alive at this time. I, I have no idea how they would have interpreted what was going on with these massive, massive floods. Another view uh, showing what the Great Salt Lake would have looked like, Lake Lahontan, Lake Manley, some of the other some of the other some of the other pluvial lakes across the American West. Uh, we're done with that. Medieval warm, whatever. It got warmer a little bit in parts. It wasn't a global warming. It was just a localized thing. It allowed the Vikings to settle Iceland and Greenland. Then it settled back into a little ice age. Things got colder. Parts of North America froze. Glaciers expanded a little bit. Vikings were able to expand when it was warmer, and then they got chased back when it got colder. The reason for that, Milankovitch cycles. I'm not going to spend any time talking about it. This is all the stuff that we talked about from the chapter on climate change. We've got changes in Earth's orbit on a cycle of 100,000 years. The direction the axis points in changes on a cycle of 26,000 years. And the amount of tilt changes on a cycle of 41,000 years. Put all those things together and you end up with a pattern of 90,000 years of cold, 10,000 years of warm. Yeah, temperature, carbon dioxide, and methane. Temperature, carbon dioxide, and methane. Uh, carbon dioxide and methane higher than any time they've been in the last million years. The highest CO2 level you can see is 300. Now we're, now we're into 400 and teens, like 419, 418, someplace in there. Humans have never been alive on Earth at a time when there's been this much carbon dioxide. This is unprecedented in history. More Milankovitch cycles. Uh, as, as a result of global warming, these are wildfires in, uh, in Iceland. Iceland, Greenland have been experiencing wildfires recently. As the planet warms, glaciers are shrinking almost everywhere. 95% of alpine glaciers are in retreat. There's a couple of glaciers that are getting bigger, but that's as a result of global warming. Those glaciers that are getting bigger are in the, the very narrow zone where it's colder, or rather it's warmer. It's warmer, so there's more water vapor, so there's more snow falling. So there's a couple places where the glaciers are getting bigger, but the glaciers are getting bigger because of global warming. Warmer, a warmer atmosphere, a warmer atmosphere can have more water vapor, so you get more snow. So it might be warmer in the summertime, so the glaciers melting back. But right now, they're getting enough snow in the winter to more than make up for that. Of course, that will change as it continues to warm. Those glaciers will also be retreating before too long. Montana's glacier Glacier National Park is expected to be glacier free by 2050. 150 glaciers in 1910, now fewer than 30. Like I said, those are all expected to be gone, all melted away uh, by 2050. Here we have 1938, 1998, 2009, shrinking glaciers in Glacier National Park. Definitions of polar environments. The Arctic uh, uses the 10 degree isotherm, which corresponds with tree line. So thank you for that, Vladimir Kirpin, your acknowledgement of the importance of the 10 degree Celsius isotherm. Covered with floating sea ice, glacial ice. The Antarctic is defined mainly, mainly by Antarctica. It's a landmass, massive landmass surrounded by ocean, much colder than the Arctic because of continentality. So here we have the 10 degree isotherm delimiting the Arctic. The Arctic, Antarctic Convergence, which is an ocean current uh, designating the Antarctic region. Recent polar changes, more than half of Arctic pack ice has disappeared. The Northwest Passage is open now. The melt zone is moving upward in elevation. More and more melt ponds, which are a positive feedback loop. Many, many streams flowing off the glaciers, through the glaciers, under the glaciers. Uh, the streams that flow on top of the glaciers melt down to the bottom, and then they lubricate the base, so the glaciers are sliding faster into the ocean. 
Large sections of ice shelf are breaking free in Antarctica. We'll take a look at ice shelves in just a second. Unforeseen vegetation growth in polar regions. Penguins uh, are being affected by ticks. They've never had to deal with ticks because it's just been too cold. Now ticks are showing up. Uh, a couple of years ago, 96% of, of Greenland was melting in June, July, in the summertime. Massive melting. The breakup of these ice sheets. So, for example, this is the Ross Ice Shelf. This is land, the ice in these regions. This is showing the thickness of ice. So all, the, all of the, whatever that is, aqua blue color, that's ice floating on water. The blue areas, there's ice that's on the land. So here we've got a, another cross section through Antarctica showing how much of it is below sea level here in West Antarctica. In fact, almost oh, over 6,000 feet below sea level. So the top of the glacier is about 6,000 feet above sea level, but it's carved out this canyon that's more than 6,000 feet below sea level. So the ice shelves are floating. They're ice that's just floating on the ocean and those are breaking up and melting away. They don't add to sea level because the ice is already in the ocean. So when they break up, it doesn't add to sea level, but when they, when they are gone, the ice on the land flows faster into the ocean. And when the glacier, when the ice flows off the land into the ocean, that raises sea level. Uh, one of the other problems is that the grounding line, the surface of the ground, you can see, it slopes down. So right here is the, the grounding line, the point of contact between the ice and the bottom of the ocean. And you can see it slopes down. So as, in fact, right now, the ice is melted back over to here. So it's just going to melt faster and faster and faster and faster. Recent research done with remotely operated vehicles has found new warm currents that are melting away the ice from the bottom. So we know that the ocean is warmer, we know that the air is warmer, so we, we scientists were expecting more melting of the ice, but they were unaware of these deep warm currents that are circulating in and melting back, uh, melting back here at the grounding line where the glaciers are held against, held against the ground. In fact, scientists often say that the ice shelves act as a cork holding the glacier in the bottle. So if you take the cork out of the bottle, everything's going to flow faster into the ocean. Here's another view. All of these are ice shelves. They're breaking up. They're retreating. And this is showing the flow, the rate of flow of ice. So here we have the red is high flow, and these areas are all ice shelves. So here, slow flow. Here, very, very rapid flow. And as these ice shelves break up, and melt, the ice on the land flows faster and faster into the ocean. Greenland, same thing. Uh, melting, 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 black carbon. Wildfires, another positive feedback loop. Black carbon from wildfires is settling out under the ice, melting it faster. So across the Northern Hemisphere, the wildfires are melting back the ice, which is warming the planet which causes more wildfires, which produces more black carbon. And that's it for the chapter on glaciers. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I'm going to make another, another just let's look at some Google Earth features for those of you that want to check out some glacial features in Google Earth. That's it for glaciers. I wish you good luck on your final exam.